Good morning, gents. How are you? Good, good. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah. Well, it's really nice just to have a little hang, and uh, thanks for agreeing to give me a little bit of a hand on my getting back into jazz uh, adventure. Uh, the, to try and make a long story kind of short, I, I played jazz quite a bit, I guess, over the years. I played in a swing band when I was about 15 or 16, playing like standards like night and day and all of that sort of stuff, like a vocal uh, band. I never did much soloing because there was an incredible uh, saxophonist had like a Paul Desmond kind of vibe going on. So soloing wasn't really my bag. And I never felt very comfortable in that zone anyway, because at that time I was still primarily a rock guitar player. But uh, I've always enjoyed it. And I've particularly liked like Joe Pass was always a, a, a big hero for me, that solo guitar thing. I've learned over the years, maybe 10 or 15 Joe Pass things that I've transcribed and at some point might have been able to play kind of roughly along with him, uh, usually with a few gaps of things. Uh, but mostly I spent my time learning fusion-y things like uh, Larry Carlton and Robin Ford in the kind of the fusion side of their blues things. Uh, but I haven't played much jazz in the last 15 years probably, right? So like, like I, I, every now and again I've picked it up and, I, and I've tried to walk a bass or whatever and I've done a few lessons on on kind of slightly jazzy things. Even maybe done a couple of arrangements of jazz songs that I've enjoyed just as something creative to do. But there's been a couple of sticking points that I've had each time when I've tried to push through and uh, you don't appear to suffer from any of them. So I thought like, okay, let's see if I can't, <laughs> if, if, if Jens can help me uh, through. And I guess that the, the primary problem for me is not sounding like I'm making the changes. So if, I, if I'm playing a blues, I've got enough blues vocabulary that I can just play and I, and, and I kind of imagine it, I hear it. When I'm playing jazz, I'm always thinking too much, which I know is probably a problem uh, already that might be a separate one. But I tend to be, because I'm thinking, I tend to be running arpeggios, basically. So if, if I'm playing all of me or if I'm playing a blues or whatever, I'm outlining the chords all the, the, the you know, the very, very arpeggio based yeah. things. I try and make it melodic and I try and find a little phrase or something that it's, it's not like I'm hopefully not just starting on the root note and playing arpeggios. <laughs> that would be a disaster. But the, <laughs> but it's still very much here. And I have trouble finding a motive or whatever that I can run through a, a pattern of changes. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, that makes sense. But I think there are sort of uh, several things that you can, uh, how you can approach that. So, of course, you, you kind of need to, to be able to play the changes and there's not necessarily anything wrong with with playing arpeggios, um, but at the same time, you of course still want to make it melodic, and it has to be more than just sort of technical, more than more than just playing the right notes, you know. So um, I guess how do we how do we sort of start with this? So one thing that I thought was really useful, um, which is maybe taking it a little bit further back. Um, from 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 playing music right away, but it's more like a technical thing. Is this idea of connecting scales and arpeggios, so that you're not only playing arpeggios, but you're also already sort of putting them in the context of, of where you need to make melodies with them. Because you're not you're not only going to be playing arpeggios. You need to sort of put them together with with uh, with the scale to create the vocabulary, the the lines that you listen to. If you listen to Joe Pass or uh, Parker or any of these guys, then then it's a mix of arpeggios and uh, and scales and a lot of other things actually <laughs> so so that's a thing to sort of look at um, because I think that that's something where we, we make it difficult at least I remember doing this for myself also when I was taught to play jazz in the beginning I was taught to go practice my arpeggios and then you would say well okay I need to know my C major scale and I also need to know my C major 7 arpeggio but I mean, now I'm learning them as two different things. And when I need to play lines with them, then it has to be like... Um, right? So it, it's a combination of those two things. So what for me it really, really changed a lot was... 
And this is something I learned from, I don't know if you know Barry Harris, if you've heard of him. Okay, so Barry Harris is a, was an American uh, piano player, a bebop piano player, who I think is actually mostly famous for teaching jazz. He had this system for teaching and he's really sort of coming out of the bebop tradition. He played with Parker and of course recorded with a lot of other people since the uh, well, 50s, I guess. Um, and his, his approach to this was to say, well, okay, you need to learn the scale. But you also want to practice all the arpeggios that are in the scale. So, like, you know, if I just play them, like, so if I just run this down, so you have a C major scale. So, of course, any scale has diatonic chords, right? So, the first one, the chord that I built on, on this note, on, on the first note, the C, is just a C major 7. Then the next one is D minor 7, E minor 7. This is stuff you already know, of course, right? Yeah. So, um, I would say, like, working on it like that is already sort of connecting uh, the different things you need. And another thing that's important about this is also, if you start listening to uh, or transcribing people like Grant Green, Benson, Pass, Parker, whoever, then when they're using arpeggios, I mean, they're not using these, essentially, essentially they're actually mostly, which is weird because we kind of teach ourselves sometimes to not start on the, on the root, but that's actually <laughs> what they do most of the time, but they only play one octave. Probably because all this language sort of was invented on a, on a saxophone where they don't have this kind of range. It's like super difficult for them to play an, uh, an arpeggio in that many octaves. So they stay within one octave. That's an interesting observation. So the, uh, when you're practicing arpeggios, the diatonic arpeggios, I've done it before <laughs> some time ago now, but doing like an arpeggio and then down the scale. Yeah. Do you... That's is, a good is, way to connect, yeah. Is, is, are there other approaches like that? Just running them up, aside from it feeling... Uh, it feels difficult under the fingers. Are, uh, it, are there other approaches like that? Or, wh or what are the things that you... Yeah, definitely. So, so the thing is, so, so this is, of course, just the most basic building block. And of course, what I would say is, if you're, if you're taking like these exercises, then you want to just take one arpeggio out and then work on making lines with that. So, so practice, if you want to play more jazzy lines, you want to practice coming up with lines and, and maybe if you can find good examples, like if you can figure out like, okay, this, this Grand Green line is really great and it's using this arpeggio, then try and see if you can make variations of it and, and use that to get the sound of his, his playing, his phrasing into your playing. Because of course, uh, one thing is playing just the arpeggio, but but you kind of need to sort of figure out a way to turn that into something that sounds like jazz also. Jazz is not only the notes, it's also how you play the notes, right? It's, it's like... You've just hit on the second thing that I wrote down, which was this idioms, is what I've called them. I don't know if they've got another name, but there's like, there are definitely little, uh, like, linguistic trademarks from jazz. Definitely. Uh, there are some that I know, the, the, the sliding up from the minor third to the major third. I don't know what this, um, this, or. Yeah, so the, the chromatic enclosures. Yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with yeah. that one and, or, or two. Are there, mm -hmm. are you aware of any kind of cataloging of them? Has anyone gone through and, and like, have you got a book of, of, of jazz? things or are you just picking them up as you're transcribing solos you're going like oh joe pass does this this way so i'm gonna nick that one little idea and then try and populate it yeah so th that's a diff that's a difficult uh because I'm, I'm trying to find those in any way that i can like there are so many of them but but i try to mostly find systems so that i can find one that that works and then um see if I can put it into other places. And there are some ways to sort of deal with that, especially with these chromatic lines. But essentially, um, let's say that you come up with something like, 
Um, Joe Spinson likes to play this kind of thing with the pitcher as well. Right, so really for our C major 7. Yeah? So what I'm doing is I'm first playing an E minor uh, 7 arpeggio, so the arpeggio from the third of the chord. And then I'm continuing up the arpeggio uh, itself, so the, the C major 7 arpeggio for a C major 7 chord. So if I have a line like that, then I'll, I mean, to try and get it into my playing, but also just to try and get as much out of it as I can. Then I'll see if I can either fit this line on other chords or see if I can make a variation of this that will work uh, with the same kind of melody. So let's say what I'm doing is I'm playing an arpeggio and then the last note or the last two notes are sort of an enclosure for the root of the next arpeggio. So I'll make that into a system and then I'll say, okay, can I work, do that someplace? So for a C major 7 arpeggio, I guess. Could do it like this so i'm doing the same thing i'm starting with c major now and then going on with an a minor seven and then i have sort of gotten more out of it in that way i, I tend to approach it more like that that i'll take bits and pieces that i like that that i inspire and often you learn them by ear like that's what that's why you're attracted to them i think if there's if it's just a list it's very difficult to make it into into music it's a lot of work to take something that's that dry and then turn it into something that that really um, inspires you to to play your own thing and work on it long enough to get it into your playing. How how much do you or have you worked on vocabulary specifically? Like as in like lines or licks? Because I, I kind of feel like there's again just coming back to myself. There are there are phrases that I've learned either like playing over a one six two five or something or, or, or just a two five one there'll be a specific line that I will practice I don't know um, or some some phrase and yeah I, I know that phrase and if I find a one if I'm improvising that phrase will come out because I don't have a, a huge repertoire of them sometimes I'll be able to manipulate a line that I know and kind of make it grow into a few different lines or a few take the same idea and put it in a different context. But I feel like that this vocabulary thing might be something that I didn't do enough of, that I should actually just sit down and learn a shit ton of lines and work on practice mm -hmm. using each one over and over again in loads of different standards, in loads of different tempos and, and varieties. But just sit down and go, right, today I'm going to go... And then see how many different ways can I use that lick? Yeah. So, but that's a difference, right? So, so that's that's. I mean, I I think I've worked on vocabulary all the time. I still do. You know, I'm still trying to get better. And even still going back to bebop stuff, listening to to old pe old old people. What I mean, old people like Charlie Parker <laughs> or something like that. And they go, like, oh man, this sounds really great. I have to figure out what that is, and then I can spend the next coming weeks just trying to see if I can get something out of that. So, so the, the process there is, of course, you need to, I mean, you, you need to, um, to just be able to play it. But I think it's very important that you introduce some flexibility really early. So, so I always felt like what I got the most out of was actually trying to write new lines. So, so not like, not, a, a, a line that's 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 like more bar, several bars long. That's just too long. It's it's not flexible. So I tend to to focus on stuff that's going to be like or uh, um, uh, you know, and then I'll just use that as much as I can, and then figure out like what can I do with it. And I will still return to those lines and try to use them again and and try to put them together with other stuff. And when I'm working with other small ideas to expand my vocabulary. Then, um, then I'm using these and putting them together and, and creating new things. And that way, sort of all the time trying to mix things together that I already have. Mm. So, okay, if, if, I'm just going to pick your brains about this a little bit more because this is an interesting part. Uh -huh. So uh, learning 2-5-1 or whatever. So, so much of jazz is based around a 2-5. So rather than learning a whole 2-5 phrase, would you tend to learn just a little snippet for a minor chord or a few 
a little snippet for the five chord and then try and join them together rather than it being so because I've definitely got a range of uh, that was a pretty crappy version but yeah but that, that you, idea, also, you also realize that you can only use that in one way right yeah so so that's and that's a problem because that's not what you want I mean you, you don't want to have these big chunks that, that are difficult to make music with be, also because one thing is that like it fits perfectly on a 251 but if you're playing a solo that 251 is maybe just one part of the song and it has to fit with everything else that's moving on around it and that's super difficult to get to work uh, so so you want to have something that's that's at least more flexible you need to think in building blocks we don't we can't think in individual notes when we're improvising that's it's too fast right so so you need to think in building blocks but you you need to have those phrases in there so that you can sort of fit them together that you know how they work and i i tend to indeed think in like three four between three between three and eight notes probably you know something like this that I'll, I'll, I'll be able to sort of fit together. And then really I spent most of my time working on vocabulary composing, like really just giving yourself the time to figure out like, how am I going to get this into my playing so that it sounds great, uh, so that, that I can play it and I can sort of listen to it and go like, okay, did that work? And then if it doesn't work, why doesn't it, doesn't it work? Or um, if it sounds too similar to what I already know, what can I change? You know, so you give yourself the time to do that, and then you put that to use on songs. Do you when you're improvising? Do you sp uh, extract the bits? So if I let's say I sat down and did a half an hour practice on two five ones, and and I'm like working on a particular area or whatever, and I'm, I'm trying to link the arpeggios and the scale smoothly, or going from a minor arpeggio to using the altered scale on the 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 five chord and resolving it or whatever. I've got some sort of thing i'll explore mm -hmm. and and let's say 50 percent of the time it's just like i'm i'm late getting to the target no or there's something that, that just doesn't quite work in the line when if i find one though because sometimes i'll play it and be like oh yeah that was that one worked really well like there'll be a little phrase would you then extract it and like do you do you keep a, a pad do you write stuff down like that and then keep it as something that you develop or you just go oh i like that idea and then you'd stop straight away and just focus on that one little gold nugget that you in, in, in uncovered? Um, oh, that's difficult. I think, I, think, I think sometimes I will do it like that. Sometimes I will, if I'm working on a specific sort of piece of vocabulary, then probably I won't really take it to a song before I can sort of compose lines with it, before I can get that to work good, work, work and, and give me something that, that I think, okay, this sounds good. And, and then, then I'll start using it. And then probably when I then start using it and I'm playing it in the song, then I'll try to evaluate like, okay, what, what am I doing with it? Is there something that could be better or is there something I can still sort of work on with it? Um, is it always in the, for, for instance, a very common thing I find myself doing is if I'm learning a new piece of uh, vocabulary, like let's say this, uh, this pivot of picture. Right, so one way that we like to play arpeggios in jazz, so this is just a C major 7 arpeggio, is to play the first note high and then go down to take the rest. So essentially it's the same set of notes, I'm just starting up here, right? But it's a nice way to, to create lines that are skipping around. So that you don't have a very common thing that we run into in the beginning and also because it's easier to play. I guess on any instrument, but certainly on guitar, is that we just play lines that are just like moving like scales up and down with a chromatic note and then an arpeggio and then... But it's nice to have these... Right? It's just so, so much more interesting as a melody. So... So I'm work, if I'm working on that, then I'm probably gonna start all my lines with it in the beginning, right? Because that's like, oh, this is what I want to learn, so... And then, then I'll do that, and then you listen back to your solo. So I record myself a fair amount when I'm practicing. And then you go like, oh, actually, this new thing is always in the beginning of the line. So I need to figure out, okay, so how can I change that? So in this case, 
I do. I think that was one of those you played actually. I'm not sure. But it's like a chromatic enclosure in front of that arpeggio, and in that way, it's getting sort of into the line so that I don't have to start with a new idea, but I have an old idea that leads into the new idea, and I'm just gradually getting it sort of in there. And do you tend with, to with do that on on short chord progressions, or would you immediately put it into a tune? Um, so I think when you're writing stuff, I do then I will do very short progressions. Like I'll do a two five one or a turnaround or something short like that, and then um, as soon as I want to use it, I'm on a tune. I think sometimes it's a it's a danger that we um, that we sort of go work with these loops of, of short progressions because and I mean <laughs> I'm as guilty as everybody else like I'm teaching a million two five one tricks with chords and scales and arpeggios and all sorts of stuff but um, a part of learning jazz guitar is also and a part of learning any style is to learn to play something that's a piece of music that's telling a story has dynamics, all these kind of things. And if you have this, this static loop, then, then you, you're not learning all of that. And, and th that's why we're sort of so focused on what notes to play, hitting the changes, where often if we're playing something like, like the way we're practicing now and the, way I'm, the information I'm giving you now, uh, you're going to be playing a lot of eight notes. But if you want to learn to play jazz, you also want to just take a simple song and it can be like 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 a blues and f or something and then also just work on going right so so just these small uh, simple rhythmical phrases because that's also a part of the language and you're never going to get to that if we if we're just going to dive into oh it's all going to be about what notes to play this, I feel like, goes back to almost the very first thing that I was... When I was saying about like not running arpeggios, maybe I meant... Maybe there's a better way that I could describe it. And that would be... I'm going to call it chasing the changes. Just because that... Like, the... the if I listen to the... The guys that I really like listening to when, I, when I'm listening to jazz, they, it's almost like they're they're not outlining the changes so much. So Joe Pass, the, the older school guys, maybe they're outlining the changes a bit more. But if you listen to, I don't know, Julian Lange or wherever, the, you know, the, the modern guys, you don't hear them running arpeggios. You don't hear the changes as much. And you hear much more of like a, a, a thematic, a, a theme with development or something. So it, it, it's less about the the making the changes all the time and outlining it. Like if, if we were playing, if you're playing now, if you if, if I asked you to play um, I don't know, Autumn Leaves or something, you know, like a common a chord progression that I might recognize or any standard, mm -hmm. I'd probably hear the changes, right? If I specifically asked you, hey, can you play that tune? I'd probably go, oh, that he's playing that tune because you recognize the harmonic movement. But I also feel like that the guys that, the guys that really nail it have a f they outline the changes but still while having a, a a theme or a link between the pieces it's not like uh oh i know this lick here now i'm on e now i'm on a now i'm on d minor now i'm on e yeah, no, definitely. There's, there's something like they... I've been trying... I was just literally this morning uh, before our session, I was trying to figure out what it was that was wrong. And I, I feel like I can sometimes force myself to do it if, I, if I'm... Uh, I'm just going to stick with this um, all of me changes because it's a kind of easy example. But I could force myself to go... Like I can f force myself to yeah. do it by doing a, a an easy melodic rhythm, and then the rhythm is the thing that's tidying it all together. But people do it while they're still doing eighth notes, and this is the thing that 
I, I, I haven't. I can't figure <laughs> out how. It, ah, but you have to. Okay, so, but I mean, this is also like you, you practice it, right? So, so, so you get better at at hearing those lines and hearing like what will happen if I play something. So. Um, So, so at some point I, I kind of let go of the of that, but it's, but I think it's really like taking this idea that what you play, if if you have space between your phrases, the most important person to listen to is yourself. So you need to listen to what did I just play, and when I when I listen to what I just played, what does that make me want to play? So if you want to develop that that aspect of it. Then I, I think it's it's really just about um, about forcing yourself to do what you just did, and then gradually making it more complicated. You know, like like okay, what what is it what is it like to to voice lead this melody to the next chord? And do I need to voice lead it or do I need to move it? So. Uh, right, that will be voice leading it. But you can do other things with it because this is again, it's a composition. If, if, I guess I never read composing books, but I would imagine there are books on this that you can do. And then you can hear like, I, I also, the, the thing that, that becomes uh, a problem with this, when you use it like this in the beginning can be that you're, you're not developing anything, you're just repeating. So it gets robotic. So you also need to be aware of that. So you need to, to go. Right? And then, then it becomes much more interesting because it's like you hear something and you hear the repeat. If I was to repeat it one more time, people are going like, yeah, okay. Or at least, I don't know, my, my, my taste went went, oh, oh, that's not good. So I, then I start changing it. And then, and then I, I take it even further away. And then I maybe get up with, get into a new sort of, uh, and I mean, this is a part of practicing as well. And of course you need to learn the song and know it so well that you have that freedom. That can be tricky. It's, it sounds like, like it's a different approach, but in a way it's, it's not so much because you still need to have that overview and you still, but you also still, need to practice the skill of developing a motif or playing corresponds with yourself. And actually this is the same, like, like I said, like you need to listen to yourself. So the way I develop that, uh, in my playing to the degree that I have that is, um, is also to, to kind of compose or play rubato. So you will play something that's like, okay, I'm playing all, uh, all of me. Um, And then, so now I actually, to me, so what, what that sounds like to me is like, okay, I had a motif, uh, and then I took that to the E7, but because I already played it sort of twice on the C major and once on the E7, I felt like it needed to end, kind of. I needed to develop it, so, so and I'm just, Doing this rubato, I'm just just trying to listen to what I played, and get used to how that works, and then that that will come into your playing also. But of course, like this, then I'm gonna give you like ten years of homework just in this session. No, this is <laughs> I'm I'm starting to get that. I think that the it it could be that the things that I'm chasing, I was expecting faster results than than was realistic. Because the the, uh, I think that I made some bad decisions about what I was. But practicing. don't you think? I mean, if you if I just hear you, like the way you were just playing that motif and moving it through the changes, then it's not so much that you need like the the skills are already there. You just need to 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 sort of strengthen the muscle of using that when you're playing, and also just just making that a part of your system so that when you're playing, because it can also be a little bit that when we come to jazz, then, then of course we start thinking about the notes, you know, it's like, oh, you have to play the right notes. Where's the arpeggio? Where's the root? Where's the third? 
and then we're not sort of taking that step back and listening to what it sounds like and listen to how does it become a melody and give yourself the freedom to not hit the third on the beat one all the time. And, and that as much as maybe what you need to work with, right? It's like, you don't really, you probably kind of know how to do this. You just need to not get caught up in jazz school whenever you try to play all of me. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, yeah. I think hitting the th third on the chord is probably exactly one of those things that I've practiced to the point where if I don't do it, it doesn't feel right. But I know that it's one of the things that makes it all sound the same. Because if that's, if we, I know we were talking about like bigger melodic ideas, motifs to develop. But at the same time, if I hit the third, no matter what shit I play, if I hit the third on beat one every time, it's going to start getting pretty boring after half a chorus, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, at least, I mean, I've, I've certainly been there and done that. And, and that's also the kind of thing where, uh, and, and for me, at least that takes some, some time. I don't know how, how that works for you, but if I'm practicing and I'm recording one of my solos and then trying to listen to it, th then sometimes you're, you're wondering, like, and it can take a few days. You're like, why does it always sound like this? What's happening? And before you've sort of figured out like, okay, it's because I'm always getting lost in playing changes in this part or... I'm missing something else. You need to sort of figure that out and then open it up. And, and that takes some time. But then once you figure out what the problem is, it's a lot easier to fix. I mean, that's, that's, that's probably the first part of it. I think, I guess, for me, some of the frustration is that I can play quite effortlessly in, if, if there are no changes or it's not jazz, I, I don't have, uh, like, I can hear it. I can, I can, I, it, it's almost like, when I'm faced with jazz changes or th things that I have to think about, the thinky part of my brain hijacks the part where I just listen and, and play instinctively and all of the instinct goes out the window and I'm suddenly forced into this thinky land and then I, th then I stink. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, uh, it, it's trying to, f but I don't know, I haven't. But how many songs do you really know? Jazz standards. Yeah, I mean, because like really knowing a jazz standard, um, I think it was Pat Metheny that that's, that was asked about like how how can you be so free when you're playing all the things you are? It sounds just like I'm only this free if I'm playing on a blues. And he just said, well, yeah, I just practice all the things you are so much that it's like playing a blues. I don't have to think about it. So so a part of that is also, and I think that's really underestimated, and also. Uh, for me, like something that I still just hit my heads again, hit my head against the wall with how long it takes to really learn a song, but also that what you get from learning a song so well that you don't have to think about the changes is the, the like the, that's where the, you can really start to develop all the other stuff where you where you start noticing uh, that you're hitting the third all the time, because in the beginning, if you don't know the song well enough, then you have to worry about what the next chord is. So you kind of need to get to the point where you can sort of leave that a little bit behind. And, and I mean, it's not the only thing that's happening here with, with the thinking, because that's also with jazz, but that, that can definitely be a thing. Like the most important song to learn is that first song that's, that you really know. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I've definitely, I mean, I've, I've known and, it, and, and here we get into what, what knowing is, <laughs> because it's like yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've, done, I've done jazz gigs before, embarrassingly, not, uh, definitely not very well, but, I, you know, I've memorized 50 standards, like the, 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 the changes and the melody and, and uh, you know, fumbled my way around the changes, but definitely not doing very well with them, you know, and, and not making any kind of statement, but just just about getting by so it wouldn't be embarrassing maybe that 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 level but that means one of the things that i i know about my playing that sucks in jazz one of the many things is that i tend to play in very similar areas all the time so if i'm playing all of me on the c chord i'm going to be down here playing something here or here maybe here but because because the next chord's E, and I don't know many licks here for that E, this E7, I'm much more likely to be here. So if I'm going here, 
I'm going to move straight away into my nice little E shape here. I know that E's here. I know the arpeggios. I can play, I know all of the scales and I know the arpeggios, but in jazz land, it, I somehow get directed into these little boxes where I, you know, if I move outside of them, I get even more just straight arpeggios and it, it, it makes me feel weird. And I don't know if it's, again, I, th I, th I, think, I think we all have it, but I think that's, that's part of opening it up, right? So, so um, definitely something I spend time on uh, and also, also still return to once in a while because we all will have that. It's like you're playing a song and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, um, th this chord here, that's, that sucks. <laughs> we need to figure this out. But um, I, I guess I, what I very often find myself doing is that I'll actually restrict myself to one area and just go like, well, if I need to open up this, like if there's something I can't play here, then, then, then I'll just play the whole song here and just stick there for a chorus or two and then try to see like, okay, what is here? And then even if you have to have to like slow it down and stop and figure out, okay, how do I play? How do I play E7 here? You know, what can I do with it? Also, not just like, but, but also, you know, so there's like some, some melodic thing in there as well that, that you, you sort of see more than than, than just the, the arpeggio or something that you just find a way to have some idea in there. And of course, the first time you have to do that, that's a lot of work, you know, that's really hard work. But even with the same song, if you do it here, then when you have to do it here, it's going to be a lot easier because it, I mean, it's all the same in the end. There are the same melodies and the different chords will sort of repeat and, you know. It's funny though, I think what, so my little plan that, that I'm, I, I want to challenge myself with for the, the second half of this year is to get my jazz playing back to the point where I could sit down with you and play a tune and not feel like a complete idiot, right? I'm not going to be burning it up, but just like, I want to be confident enough to be able to play a tune at a, if I sat in with a, a jazz thing. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'm going to try and do like three one hour practice sessions a week on it. That's about the most that I think I can realistically get. It's not a huge amount, but it's more, much more practice on jazz than uh -huh. I'm doing right now, right? Like three hours a week more. Um, but I'm already feeling like the, I need to be working on my tunes. I need to be working on arpeggios and just running the tunes. And I need to be working on these like uh, motive, uh, not motive ideas, the idiom ideas, like that the pivot arpeggios or adding in the chromatic frames or uh, what do you call it? Chromatic encapsulation? Is that the word? What was uh, that? Enclosures. Enclosures. Yeah. Chromatic enclosures. Um, so those things I need. But when we start talking about like playing in one area and not just playing the arpeggio, that requires the use of those uh, melodic ideas. Otherwise, it's just going to be an right. arpeggio or a scale. So there's like, there is already now a, a list of things that I'm like, how am I going to divide those phrases up. Yeah, okay, but but then then I would say like start with the song. Like so 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 focus on just um, finding a song that you want to keep on playing that that you that you can keep on playing for at for at least uh, a few weeks, like a few a few months realistically, I think. Um, and I mean, that's I also still practice songs for a long time, right? Uh, to qu quote somebody else, Kurt Rosenwinkel talked about how he learns the standards uh, and he says that when he's practicing a standard, the first thing he will do is that he'll spend an hour playing the melody, which is insane. I mean, I don't have time for that, but <laughs> I wish I had, but hey, um, <laughs> so, so, so that, that, yeah, so that there's a level of commitment and if you want to reach that level, that's the commitment. But um, at the same time, you want to keep on working on it. And then, then the important thing is, it has to become a piece of music. And it doesn't necessarily matter where on the neck your piece of music exists in the beginning. I would be much more sort of, just don't be afraid to limit yourself and go like, okay, I'm going to focus on this area of the neck and make sure that I can play all the chords here. And then I'm going to take one more you can still play, I mean, you can still play a good solo in this area of the neck and be a heavy camper. And it's much more effective 
than playing uh, an okay solo here and then sort of something that maybe works when you're down here in the same solo that's kind of screwing the rest up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I have less so problems. So in that way, that's maybe not as important. I, I have more problems staying in the one spot than I do following the areas that fit around the 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 changes. Mm -hmm. I, I, that, that probably doesn't make much more sense. If I, if I'm playing a two five one in in C, if I start here on D, I'm going to move to G here. Like I, 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 it's yeah. unlikely I'm going to go D because <laughs> I'm already like, where's oh no, where's my G altered scale here? <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you think so, right? Yeah, okay. So, so I guess it's it, I would I would say like whatever you work on like this, maybe just try to see if you can force yourself to stay in one place. In a way, I mean, I, I think that's that would be the place I would start with. Another thing where, where and, and I think that really does sort of work as well, uh, is what I started saying, like, focus on the arpeggios that are like this in the scale, so that if you have to play a 2 5 one it's all in the same place. And also because essentially it is, it is in the same place, it's all in C major, it's, it's just a chord progression in C major, so it shouldn't skip around, it doesn't, I mean, it's nice if you can, but you don't have to. You shouldn't so have how, to. Okay, so let's say for the next, uh, after I've got my little plan together, I'm going to pick a tune. A lot of the tunes that I love the most are more complicated ones, like, I don't know, Stella by Starlight or Body and Soul or something like that. Or, or do you, would you think a better choice for this initial stages would be something super simple, not Autumn Leaves, because it, that song just drives me a bit mad now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, all of me, or uh, I'm trying to think what other really nice simple tunes. Pedido, take the A train. A train, but see, A train's got that yeah. funny seven uh, sharp eleven house. thing in it, which is is quite quirky to have. No, I suppose it, no, and it's got the nice no, long F major it. seven just, as well. I mean, yeah. just play D seven. Just play it as a D seven. Mm -hmm. You I can mean, always it's, change it's, the, the flat five in there. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not because it's a difficult thing to play. It's just a very quirky... Uh, in, in my musical imagination, when I hit it, it's, it's very free there. You could go wacky whole tone or something over it, and it's a, it kind of... It, it, it sounds cool, but... Uh, yeah, no, but it's, it's got all of the other things. That's a, a, what, what other ones uh, do you think are good starters? Um, yeah, so like, so like I said, Perdido is a good one because it's just basically a 2-5 uh, that's repeated and then a rhythm bridge. Um, yeah, so A train. So. Wait, wait, rhythm changes, doing something on rhythm changes or too complicated because it's too busy? I would say it's too busy. I mean, I, uh, if, it depends on what you want to do, right? If, if you want to work on your ability to nail the changes and play lines in changes, then it's good. It's probably great for your level, like 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 where you're at, because you can already do a lot and you know what a G altered is and all that stuff. So you can develop that if you're working on that. But if you also want to work on, on being a bit more motivic, more open, more free, and with the melodies and the rhythms, then that's like a it can be a little bit of a prison. You get locked into the changes all the time. I mean, if you if you need to play changes, rhythm changes is as difficult as giant steps. It's not as difficult to hear, but still. Um, uh, so yeah, so that one pinned up house is easy. Also, it's just a bunch of two fives. Um, Afternoon in Paris is a good one too. It, it's only two fives, but then a different, a few different keys. Uh huh. That sounds like it would be a nice one. Um, let me see. I just made a video on this. I think that was all five. <laughs> I missed that. Otherwise, I'd, I would have known the answer already. Okay, uh, <laughs> I will look that up as well. Um, so, as a plan, then, so I'm going to pick a tune, make sure that mm -hmm. I've got vocabulary for all of the things, work on one area, make sure that I've got all of the arpeggios for that tune in one part of the neck, uh, 
hopefully try and make them a little bit more melodic, more melodic with uh, little idioms or ideas for little jazz nuances. Yeah. Uh, working on things like the melody, that's the, just another thing there that I'd, I, I enjoy the chord melody thing. Do you feel like there's a lot of benefit from figuring out the chord melody for the tunes as well? Um, there's definitely a lot of benefit from learning to do that in terms of um, dealing with the melody and dealing with a melody when you're working with chords. But I think for improvisation, I, I, I think it's quickly, like, I don't know, I, I get the impression that it's, it's a lot of, for people who want to get into jazz, it, it can be a distraction that you've, you're working too much on, on chord melody and working um, on things that are more arranging where you might be better off just developing your improvisation and developing your ability to hear um, the right type of, of rhythms, the right type of melodies, also just because that's going to make your chord melody a lot stronger. Um, so, so I would, yeah, I don't know, I, I very often find myself telling people to not get lost in chord melody too soon. Yeah. It is, it's, it's arranging really, isn't it? That's the, I'm sure it's beneficial in some ways, but it's not. No, it's definitely beneficial. I mean, it's a really cool way to, to hear the melody and the chords together. That's super useful, of course, but it tends to be the kind of thing that, that, that then overshadows everything else, you know, and, and then, 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 then maybe it's just me and the people that I teach that I've run into that a lot, but I, I, I tend to to have to tell people to sort of back down on, on working on inversions and chord voicings and just getting their basics together with soldering. That's a good idea. Okay, uh, I think I've got myself a bit of a plan. One other thing that I want to, uh, at least one of those sessions, I'd like it to be transcribing jazz stuff, just because I feel like there's, when you're transcribing things yourself, you absorb uh, the, the feel and the idioms and all of that sort of stuff go in a bit better. Uh, yeah. Can you recommend me a couple of tracks that you think are, 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 are songs where by learning and transcribing the solos gives you a lot of great food? Like if you can think back to uh, yeah, specific definitely. tunes. Uh, so I think there are two people you want to listen to and see who you who you want to uh, want to copy and who. I mean, a lot of this with transcribing is also it kind of has to inspire you to some degree as well. Otherwise, it's not going to be as useful, I think. Um, Grant Green. Right. I would ch check him out, like early Grant Green. Um, it, probably probably something like a, one of his blues solos, like there's some stuff there. What's great about Grant Green is that rhythmically, he's super interesting. And his a lot of his vocabulary is like straight out of Parker, like really just straight bebop, but then made into guitar vocabulary. So when you learn from him, you get the right, you get all the, uh, you know, those kind of things, but it's playable on guitar. And it's also in a tempo that's like, that's, that's easy to figure, easier to figure out that's playable on guitar <laughs> for, <laughs> compared for, to Parker. For some reason I've never, I don't think I've even ever listened to Grant Green. That's crazy. I, I know I'm familiar with the name, but I'm not, no, I mean, actually for me the same. It's like I, I only discovered him when I started teaching, which is also, to me, was also like failure from my teachers, actually. <laughs> okay, he's, he's definitely someone uh, uh, I'll check out for sure. Um, yeah, and then uh, another one that I would, I would suggest checking out, especially also, um, no, actually two. So uh, the one that they all checked out, Charlie Christian, right? And, and with him, um, the language isn't really developed yet. So he's sort of standing with one foot in swing and then trying to figure out how to make bebop. But what is, is interesting about him is that you really get um, sort of a, a straight line into all the phrases where if you're playing um, all of me like... Right? 
and you want to be able to to tell that story of those changes even if i'm just hitting the third and still you want to tell the changes and tell the story and make it interesting with a few notes you can learn that from him i think that that would be one of the guys where I would, the other guy who kind of does this as well if you, is if you check uh, early jim hall uh -huh. like 50s early 60s jim hall the later stuff gets super complicated but the first part is really distilled and actually coming straight out of uh child christian also the bridge is my favorite sure. jazz record of all time so that's like that i there you go uh, then, then i will start with him actually i would like check out the uh the first jim hall album i think it's just called jazz trio it's like from 56 and he's really good at playing super melodic he's so melodic and so rhythmical the bridge to 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 come onto that would be that's kind of like the the ideal world of this there's loads of changes and there's loads of things going on but you don't hear it like you, there's no yeah. there's there's just these phrase it's almost like the the melodies that they play are so strong that the changes don't matter it's like you can play whatever shit you want i'm gonna play this and it's still it's so grounded like that's i guess that would be the aspirational ideal is that how the hell do they get there but then that is jim hall so maybe it's a bit <laughs> um, ambitious to think that i'm i don't know i mean i mean that, then then jim hall is definitely one of those to go for you know and also i think if you have the the that's that's actually also the case on the bridge like it's it's from before solos were like seven minutes long so <laughs> they're a little bit easier to learn i've not listened to earlier jim hall stuff though i must admit so i i, I that will be an interesting uh, excursion uh to go back in back in time and check that out um okay what I'd like to do, James, if, if this is all right, I, I want to run with these ideas for like a month or something and see how far I get. Could we do this again? And I'll because I've got a feeling that the of course. Uh, as I start scratching at some of this stuff, I'm going to encounter more uh, more problems that I, I think that you. Yeah, <laughs> you, you've definitely you all of the, the questions that I've I've thrown at you, you've answered in a way that's like it's given me a lot of confidence that, you know, <laughs> you know, this shit really good. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to hit you up again in the future. Yeah, no, definitely. That could be a lot of fun. I mean, I think it's also nice to talk about because I think some of the questions you come with, uh, they're not exactly myths, but, but it's like you can, you can approach something and make it more difficult than it is where sometimes if you just, take a step back and like think about okay what's going to make this good music what's going to make this something i can actually practice instead of just going all the neck in all keys and, and difficult you know <laughs> it's so easy sometimes it's like if we can just step back and just work on it in a simple one place it's a lot easier to learn and then actually all the other stuff is going to come yeah you know? I, I gave up on the learning every phrase in every position thing I think when I was 20, I was just yeah. like, you know what, screw this. Like, it just doesn't, why would, the, the phrases that we play have to fit under your hand, right? And there's no point. Exactly. Like, we all play the easiest things. If you watch Joe, like any of the great masters play, it looks effortless and easy. They don't deliberately go and make it bloody complicated with some horrible fingering. It's no, no, I mean, uh, Joe Pass, actually, I, I, I made a video last week about Joe Pass where he talks about it. And he actually also says in that video, if it's difficult, don't play it. And and uh, Schofield has said something similar. I'm just gonna quote all, all the famous people. I don't have to come up with anything myself. Um, so uh, so Schofield also said that he found that most guitar players waste a ton of time trying to learn to do everything in all positions. Whereas like this is easy to play here. So that's what I want to learn to play here, and then. Whatever I need to learn to play up here has to be easy here. And it doesn't have to be the same. It has to be what works when I'm here. And it has to be what works when I'm here. And then that's how you want to approach it. I, I think that's very true. I mean, that said, of course, if you're starting to learn um, jazz vocabulary, so it's not a bad idea to just take some, um, some lines and, and, and try and move them around in different positions just to sort of figure out like, 
where is the flat mine in this position and where you know like just to have some overview and and explore it and also just to figure out like is this playable here because a lot of the stuff is playable in other places but but sometimes also like oh, man this this doesn't make any sense here throw it out you know <laughs> don't use it <laughs> this, this could be a fun little series jazz myths <laughs> because there are that, yeah, that, definitely. Uh, the, the the playing in all of the positions thing is definitely one that i wasted i don't know a hundred hours probably in in when i was like 18 to 20 or whatever and i'd first started it was before we had online instruction all that sort of stuff it was books and there were books of licks and there was like some article that you'd read in guitar player magazine where somebody says oh you should learn every lick in every position blah 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 and it's like bloody sax players don't do that they just they've only got one way of doing it right so probably those yeah that i mean and i actually i've seen also uh the same thing happen with students sometimes if, if i don't explain well enough um like like my my arpeggio exercise right so with the diatonic arpeggios then next week a student will come back and go like i really cannot get that d minor seven arpeggio to sound good on a c major seven chord and it's like yeah you don't have to it doesn't you don't have to use all of them on every chord. It's just just take the ones that work, go with them, go with, go with that, you know. Gent, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful, super interesting. Uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, we put some links, If assuming this is going on my YouTube channel, that we'll put links to your YouTube channel and uh, website and all of that other good stuff. The best place to find you is is YouTube or website or where, where do you? Yeah, yeah. No, it's YouTube. Just find, find YouTube and, and see what's there. If you don't like that, you won't like the rest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you again so much, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me.